classified as secret. March 1945, a cinematic landscape of Berlin's movie suburbs. Stierlitz will now get into a car and drive off, and further destiny of Colonel Isaev will remain behind the camera lens. I know what happened to him, but this is my secret, director Tatiana Lioznova used to say. Scriptwriter Julian Simonov, but the lot of his Stierlitz was somewhat different. I think in intelligence workers' operations a lot depends on how the situation will help you and how a single moment plays to your hands. One would like to at least slightly lift a lid on the secret of moments of Kazakhstan's Stierlitz. Chapter 1. Live Behind the Scenes this is a different landscape, not the cinematic one. The travel goes along Yerzhanova Street down to Karaganda Shoe Factory and until Yermekova, at that time known as Dzirzhinsky Street. Over two years, Sherlitz's usual route had its end point at a newspaper, Industrialne Karaganda, the Industrial Karaganda. In 1952, he worked in the editorial office of the newspaper, which until now has stood here. He was even the head of one of the departments of the Industrialne Karaganda. It was then titled as Socialistische Karaganda or Socialist Karaganda. He argued things out at editorial meetings, covered mining day-to-day -day routine. He was an SS Sturmbahnführer Max Otto von Stirlitz, also known as Maxim Maximovich Isaev, Vsevolod Vladimirovich Vladimirov, Dr. Bolzen and Eustace. There were also a few inspirations, among them Shandor Rado, Richard Zorge, Willy Lehmann, Anatoly Gurevich, Norman Baradin. Each of them are Stirlitz to a certain extent. Who does the character played by Tihanov look like the most? Baradin, Rado or Zorge? Outwardly, of course, Stirlitz, which had been played so brilliantly by actor Tihanov, looks more like this handsome man Norman Baradin. The way he carries himself, how he communicates with people, all of this makes up Tihanov from the 17 moments of spring. The image had been modeled after him. As a matter of fact, the image had been drawn from a real-life person. The author and the prototype of his literary character were friends. He had already met Shandorado. He had already received a lot of interesting information, but he still lacked a lot to create the image of Stirlitz. And brothers Weiners, Simeonov's old friends, introduced Julian to Norman Baradin, who was the former resident going under the name of Granit. The meeting was appointed at a cafe. He was such a handsome man, very suave, moustached, looking like a lord. He astounded the father with his physical impression. Norman was a great connoisseur of Western lifestyle and could socialize well. He was very charismatic. I should think so, with four or five higher education certificates obtained in different countries and a command of several languages under his belt. He was born in America, he was growing up in China and started working for intelligence there when he was still a minor. And then visits to countries followed like a kaleidoscope. Norway, France, Germany. Where he worked during the war remains a mystery. Naturally, he wasn't mouthy, but he was an excellent storyteller within the permitted limits. He gave to Julian a few real-life stories as a present. One of these stories was made into a film. Do you remember an episode when Kate says that she's scared of giving birth? Малыш, они ведь кричат на родном языке. Чего? Стану кричать по-немецки. Namely, Norman Baradin suggested including this detail to my dad, because that had already happened to him in France. His wife was pregnant and was due to go into labor. She said, Norman, I'm afraid of screaming in Russian. He said, that's okay, you will scream in French. The destiny of this child is tragic. Lenechka, as the Borodins called their firstborn, died in Kazakhstan in Almaty during evacuation. Mother was in Moscow at that time, and Norman Borodins' third daughter, Aksana, reminisces. 
mom suddenly woke up in the middle of the night and said that she had to fly out to Almaty because something had happened with Lenitschka. But how one could fly there? There was a war. Mom went there anyway and learned that on the day when she had that dream, Lenitschka had passed away. She had contracted diphtheria and was placed in a typhoid barracks because an epidemic of typhoid was going on, and she died from heart failure. Most evacuees were buried at Almaty Central Cemetery, but the little Lenitschka's grave hasn't been preserved. Kazakhstan turned out to have been intertwined with Stirlitz's destiny in a bizarre and sad way. Chapter Two: Moments of Karaganda. Cafe Elephant meeting with the wife. This is the most soul-stirring and the most far-fetched scene from the film, as the rural intelligence officers were not allowed to have meetings like that. They all didn't like the scene in which Stirlitz meets with his wife. They said, that's over the top, this is rosy stuff. But my dad explained that it hadn't been him, but the director who had made such a decision. In the last novel about Stirlitz, his wife Sashinka is condemned to shooting. His only son goes mad and dies in a camp. Stirlitz, also known as Maxim Isayev, is arrested. Stirlitz comes back to the Soviet Union after capturing Müller. He wanted to bring Müller to the Soviet Union, but instead of that he was thrown into the basement of the steamboat, delivered to Moscow, and in 1946 he was left in the basement of Lubanka. But I'm staying in my home, he thought. I'm in Lubyanka. I'm at a place where I was the last time around at Dzirzhinsky. He said in a bitter manner, saying that children preserve the memory of parents and that he dislikes obelisks. All the more so, he smirked back then, people of your profession don't have obelisks erected in their honor. They are nameless marshals about who winning soldiers will never find out. The destiny of these people was not built by chance, and this chance being that people really don't know anything about them. As is well known, life draws its own scripts. Lubanka Square without a monument to Felix Edmundovich. However, he didn't like obelisks. The building in which Tirlitz had been kept in the forest is now under repairs. He was beaten up, morally destroyed. Broken down, he leaves that place. The novel is entitled Despair. The dedication features the name of Shandor Rado. After the war, he was arrested and sentenced to 15 years. Such was the destiny of many prototypes of Stirlitz. For instance, Anatoly Gurevich was sentenced to 20 years and Norman Baradin hasn't been able to avoid this doom either. In 1948, he allegedly wrote a letter to Stalin with some complaints. Soon his father, Mikhail Baradin Grosenberg, was arrested. Norman's father, Mikhail Grosenberg, was the friend of Lenin, intelligence officer and the founder of the U.S. Communist Party. He died in the basement of Lubanka. While he was in there, Norman was arrested as well, but he emerged unscathed. Unscathed meaning that he was placed in a dungeon without any clothes on, at a temperature slightly higher than the zero, and was also subjected to other psychological and physical torture. And then his wife was arrested too. When she was brought to Karaganda and when she had to come out from jail, she refused to be left at large. She said she didn't have a penny, she didn't know where to go and what to do. That was incredible. People resist going to jail, but resisting freedom is a rare occasion. So she was given some small amount of money and guess what she did with that? She went to the central square, found a department store and bought a lipstick. Chapter 3. The Fighter of Invisible Front To take on Norman Mikhailovich Baradin as a senior literary worker to the editorial office effective from today with a salary based on cost sheet, editor of newspaper Socialistichiska Karaganda, Mular. 
Perhaps from now on, all events of Karaganda life of Sirlitz can hardly be reconstructed. Unfortunately, archive materials have not been preserved. He was exiled here with a wife and two children, and his personal file was attached to him. And then, when he was pardoned and returned to Moscow, his personal file vanished with him. Interestingly, there aren't any memoirs about him either. Nobody in Karaganda remembers such a bright, interesting and extraordinary correspondent as Baradin. I think he was a professional intelligence officer and he knew how to behave. The fact that in Karaganda very few people remember him is the norm. Such people like him living illegally were trained to live an inconspicuous life. And all the more so in Karaganda because he realized that the sword of Democles hung over his head and that if something changed in Moscow, he may have been called in, jailed and shot down. Newspaper articles are the best evidence. They were ordinary articles with the style and headlines relevant for the time and were the provincial newspaper. The fight against vestiges of capitalism in the conscience of people should be waged with equal power everywhere and always. Summary lessons of a history hobby group of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union has taken place. Capitalism defaces people, devastates their souls and slings mud at their human dignity. The articles were mainly signed as Baradin, but his other pseudonym was Barisov. He must have had a talk with a KGB officer who told him to work in a certain place, register with them, and what he could and could not write. Everything was very simple. As an experienced intelligence officer, he perfectly understood that fighting the system was a futile enterprise, and one could only hope that the system might change. But the system never changed. Meanwhile, on the screen, there is a different picture. Beautiful multi-storied houses, broad and well-lit streets, abundance of greenery. The choir on the stage is performing a grand ballad dedicated to the best friends of miners, leading mine workers to new victories and happiness to their favorite Stalin. This is how the concert of currently performing song and dance company of Karaganda Miners is being commenced. He wrote on different topics, about current affairs, culture, etc., but he had worked here not too long. And during the thaw, he went back to Moscow. He used to take photos, and I had an idea to find these films. I thought that he must have taken the films with him, because he wasn't a simple person to just leave them. If one looks at Karaganda photos, everything seems remarkable and well, but the eyes of both mom and dad are sad. They were fully rehabilitated and reinstated in the party and at work at the KGB, and in 1957 the eyes started shining again. They felt free and needed, and they felt they were humans again. After he returned from Karaganda and 30 years before the death, he had been absolutely happy because he socialized in the elite, the glitterati, and was at the crest of the wave. Later, one could say that destiny kept Norman Baradin safe. He was reinstated in his KGB service, he headed the editorial office of print agency news, those was a day-to-day -day life under his ordinary family name and without any particular risk. But some say that the past tense cannot be used with reference to intelligence officers. So did Norman Baradin like the screen character? I think that all the intelligence officers liked the screen character. Snow has melted away, birch trees came out and cranes with warm rains falling down somewhere. These are the last scenes of the 17 moments of spring. Right now Stierlitz will get into a car and drive away.